Well, hello everyone, and welcome to For the Love of Animals, a presentation of Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration 1110 AM. I'm your host, Len Sazinski from the Pinellas County Communications Department. For the Love of Animals is a celebration of our connection and commitment to all things animal-related in the Tampa Bay area. And during the next hour, we'll be sharing with you information about the animals we love and the services and programs provided by Pinellas County Animal Services. Well, first up, there are few public health threats as concerning as the spread of rabies. A bite or scratch from an infected animal can spread this deadly viral disease from animal to animal or animal to human. It is a lethal disease, killing nearly 50,000 people and millions of animals worldwide. And with all the dogs, cats, raccoons, and people in Pinellas County, it is a very important concern to us. So with us today to tell us how Animal Services is helping to stop the spread of rabies is Rabies Investigation Coordinator Jay McGill of Pinellas County Animal Services. And it's really James, but you go by Jay. Yes, that's correct. So we'll, uh, we'll honor that request here. Well, Jay, uh, rabies uh, very, very important. And I know we were talking about an interesting story uh, before the program began here about uh, it's not so much a problem in Pinellas County now, but it was a problem not too many years ago. So tell us that some of these rabies uh, uh, vaccination programs began. In 1995, I understand it was a real problem. Uh, yeah, we had a rabies outbreak. Um, it went pretty much from zero. We had like 30 cases in uh, less than a year, which kicked off a, um, a program with uh, the USDA with um, the oral rabies vaccine program. And we had a, uh, there was a quarantine area within Pinellas County. It went from Clearwater South to St. Petersburg. Um, a lot of people didn't know, you know, any animal that came into a shelter that wasn't reclaimed or didn't have proof of a current rabies vaccine was put to sleep. So we ended up putting a lot of animals to sleep. And, um, and you did wrestle the problem to the ground, and I have to give animal services a lot of credit for that. A lot of people know about animal services as the place to go to adopt a cat or a dog, a lost dog, a found dog. Uh, they help to reunite uh, lost pets and uh, needy pets with new owners. But so much a part of the mission of animal services is to control rabies. Yes. And we went from zero, from 30 incidents a year to probably zero incidents a year. When was the last time we had a rabies incident in Pinellas County? Uh, 2004, we did have a cat. Okay. And then uh, three years ago, we did have a raccoon. Did not expose a person, but did, did expose uh, someone's animal. It did test positive. So, and you were telling us uh, before the show that we're kind of we kind of have a benefit here in Pinellas County is that we are somewhat insulated from the rest of the state of Florida. So, by hammering that North County area, we can effectively control uh, the incursion of rabies into the Pinellas County Peninsula. Yes, it does help. But uh, you have to remember too, there's a lot of people moving into Pinellas County from all over the country, where it could be a, a lot higher area where they're moving from. So, it's important that everybody's animals are still vaccinated with a you know, rabies vaccine. Well, let's talk about that right now. It's so very, very important to have your cat and dog vaccinated, and I understand you can get a three-year vaccine for those animals now. Yes, as long as it's not the very first vaccine. If it's um, the very first vaccine, it's going to be a one-year rabies vaccine, and after that, it will be a three-year vaccine. And you have to remember to, to keep those vaccinations current. I mean, three years seems like a long time initially, but it goes, goes by, and you have to get those vaccines, uh, you have to get them current right away. Yeah, and it needs to be done, it, you know, and it is the law, and for good reason is to keep the public and, and uh, pets safe. Okay, tell me a little bit about the oral rabies vaccine program for Pinellas County. Uh, I understand that uh, we initiate that about once a year to keep rabies in check and to keep, uh, as you said, any animals that come from outside the county into the county to keep them from spreading rabies. Uh, how does that work? How does that program well, work? Well, basically the oral rabies vaccine is a partnership with um, the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and they actually set out... Um, small baits, their fish meal, and inside the fish meal is a rabies vaccine. It's, it's mainly used to, um, to uh, keep the raccoons in check. So how many of those are spread out throughout the area? Uh, I would say uh, up to 10,000. Up to 10,000. It just really depends. In wooded areas, in neighborhood areas, everywhere. pretty much everywhere. Yeah, and they'll usually notify the neighborhoods, you know, what, what's going on in case somebody's pets eats it or something like that. And the, the, when, the, when the raccoon gets a hold of this little tidbit, it, mm. it, there's a capsule inside with a rabies vaccine, so the raccoon becomes vaccinated. Yes. Now, if your dog or cat eats that, would, would they become vaccinated, or does that not work with dogs and cats? It wouldn't be the same. Uh, it won't hurt the dog, but the dog still needs to be um, okay. um, 
an injection, a rabies injection. Are, are raccoons the, the biggest threat, the biggest carrier that we have of rabies in Pinellas County? Actually, um, I would say second to the bat. Okay, the bat. Yes, right. bats are very very high risk carriers. And I would imagine the bats might bite a raccoon or a dog or, or even a horse, perhaps. Or possible. A lot of people wake up and they're flying around their house. Oh my goodness! <laughs> so we'll treat that as an exposure. We'll actually pick up the bat and send it out for testing. I mean, you know, we we talk about the fact that Pinellas County is the most densely populated county in Florida. It's very metropolitan, uh, very dense, but yet there are a lot of wild animals uh, in Pinellas County. Yeah, right next door to all these people. <laughs> they don't really have anywhere to go. Yeah. So they, they like to move into people's attics and underneath their houses. How, do, how uh, easily can a dog or cat pick up rabies from a wild animal? Um, you know, if, if, the, if the actual host animal is shedding the virus, that's when it can be passed on to people and animals. If a um, dog or cat is exposed to a possible rabid animal, um, if, if we don't have the animal available for testing, then their pet is going to be quarantined. Now, if it's vaccinated, though, and, and we have the papers to prove it, does that kind of spare the animal's life? No. Well, the, the animal, you mean the... The dog, dog or the cat? All, we, we don't put them to sleep. All we're going to do is quarantine the animal. If, the, if someone's dog is attacked by a raccoon and it, the dog has a current rabies vaccination, we're going to give them another vaccine okay. and to, just to booster it, and then they're going to they're be put on a 45-day quarantine at home with the owners. So just to make sure yes. that that animal doesn't get sick. Yeah, because the rabies vaccine, it makes it low risk but it does not make it no risk. Oh, okay. So an animal can still come down with the rabies vaccine even with a current even, you know even with a current rabies shot. So keep your cats inside, keep your dogs on a leash, don't let them run wild. That's the best thing you can do. What are the telltale signs of an affected animal? If I see a raccoon or a squirrel or a ferret or an opossum, how can I tell if the animal is rabid or not? In the early stages they're going to become lethargic. They're going to stop eating and drinking. Sometimes they'll start walking in circles, falling over. And then in the later stages is when what they call vicious rabies is when they'll start acting out and attacking stuff. But it's a good rule of thumb. Just leave wild animals alone. Correct. You know, a lot of people, they see a, a small animal like a baby squirrel or a baby raccoon. They want to take it in and take care of it. Or if they see an injured animal, they want to take care of it. But your advice is to just leave those animals alone. Yeah, just stay away from them and just call, your, you know, wildlife rescue or somebody to come pick it up for you. If I get bit or scratched by a wild animal, what should I do? You should contact Pinellas County Animal Services and report it, and then you need to contact your doctor. And what happens after that? Uh, if I report it to you all, do you go try to look for the animal as I describe it? We would. It depends on the circumstances. Mm -hmm. um, if you don't have eyes on the animal the whole time, okay, then you're not going to know if it's the same animal that bit you. Like if somebody's dog gets out and gets in a fight with a raccoon and the dog kills the raccoon and the raccoon's there, then we know it's the same raccoon. But if you know, if someone's outside taking their trash out and they get bit by a raccoon and then they go back in the house and the raccoon's not there any longer, I mean, you could set a trap out, but you're never going to know if it's the same raccoon or not. So I don't know if I have rabies or not at this point in time. Well, then we're going to contact, you're going to contact your doctor or you're going to go to the emergency room and they're going to start you on post-exposure treatment. What, 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 what is the, the treatment for rabies, medically speaking? Uh, what you're going to get is uh, there's going to be a series of four shots, day one, uh, day three, day seven, and day 14. The first day, they're actually going to give you a, a, an exposure vaccine and also hemoglobin, which they use to infiltrate the wound. And then after the first day, it's just going to be the vaccine that they're going to give you, and it's usually in the arm. So it's not very painful. It's just like any other Okay, any other so it's vaccine. just something I have to go through. Yes. Can I be vaccinated for rabies? Is there a human rabies vaccine? There's pre-exposure vaccines, but if you're bit by an animal, they're still going to give you the post-exposure. Okay. Yeah, it, just, it would just help. Um, it would make the risk lower that you're actually going to contract the virus, but you still, can, you still can contract it. And one of the big issues that people understand is once you start showing signs, there's no treatment for it. Ah. You, you, it's fatal. So I can't wait. You know, to see what happens, I correct. have to take uh, corrective measures right away. Yeah, there's no cure for it. So it's very serious. Rabies is very serious. It's fatal. It's, you know, it, it's, it's nothing to play with, and it, it is fatal to humans. So once again, thank you to Animal Services for having this uh, oral rabies vaccine program every year. That certainly keeps uh, things in check. But nonetheless, stay away from those wild animals. <laughs> yes, you definitely need to stay away from them. Leave them alone. Make sure you don't have any... Uh garbage outside, dog cat food outside that's going to attract them to and, your area. And don't feed them in the park. People think it's cute to feed squirrels in the park or raccoons at Fort DeSoto Park, but then they lose their fear of human beings and they're everywhere and you don't know if they're safe or not to be around. Correct.
And then uh, you show up without food, and they want some food, so they're going to come out. And they get very insistent. Uh, (laughs) They'll go go find their own food inside your tent. Correct. (laughs) Oh, my goodness. All right. Well, I'd like to thank my guest on this part of the program, Jay McGill, Rabies Investigation Coordinator with Pinellas County Animal Services. And we would encourage our listeners, if you have any comments or questions on anything we've talked about on this program, send us an email. Send it to animals at pinellascounty.org, and we'll share your concerns on a future edition of For the Love of Animals. Well, coming up after the break, Dr. Caroline from Pinellas County Animal Services talks to us about puppies. Stay with us. And we're back. Welcome back to For the Love of Animals, a presentation of Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration 1110 AM. I'm Len Sazinski with the Pinellas County Communications Department. You know, nothing is as cute as a box full of puppies. And certainly puppies look adorable when we see them in the pet store or on TV and in the movies. And if a friend or relative has a puppy, well, we all go gaga giving it attention. Puppies are indeed the first dogs to be adopted at Pinellas County Animal Services or any area shelter, and we're all happy to see that. But taking a puppy home is a big commitment. With me today to share some advice on the subject is Dr. Caroline, Director of Veterinary Services for Pinellas County Animal Services. And Dr. Caroline, hello, how are you? I'm doing well. How are you, Len? I'm good. So nice to have you on the program this morning. Well, thanks. It's great to be here. Well, puppies are ingrained in the American psyche. You know, they're just so cute and adorable. Every family wants one. Every kid wants a puppy. You know, they dream, they pray for puppies for Christmas and and, and special occasions. But if we make that decision, we're going to have a puppy in the family, how should we go about selecting the perfect puppy? That's a great question, Lynn. And there are a lot of factors that go into that decision. I think the first is, are we really ready for a puppy? I mean, it takes a lot of time. It's the equivalent oftentimes of bringing home a newborn infant. Do we have the time? time to let our puppy out every couple hours when we first get it to make sure it's learning how to be potty trained? Do we have the time to commit to going to obedience classes? Do we have the money involved, you know, to make sure that they're getting all their booster vaccinations and getting spayed or neutered when they're old enough? Wow. So so there's a lot of thought that, that goes into it. Just first, am I ready for a puppy? I think you I'll know? get a cat instead. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, or a kitten. That would be great. Well, if, if you decide you are ready and you want to make that commitment of time, what should you look for? Good health? You know, how do you tell if a healthy if a puppy is healthy? Do you, do you look for papers or what do you look for at the pet store? Well, I really encourage people to consider adoption from a shelter. Uh, you know, we deal with a lot of unwanted animals and we deal with a lot of pet overpopulation. So I think that's the first place that people should start okay. is looking at their area shelters for puppies. And they may not be able to go in just like at a pet store and get a puppy, you know, right, right when they walk in. They may have to come back several times to find the right puppy for them. So that's the first place people should start. I think the next thing people need to do before they actually go to look for their puppy is to think about their lifestyle. And, you know, there's a lot of considerations. Do they want a big dog? Do they want a small dog? Um, What about grooming? You know, what about getting a a puppy or a breed that might need a lot of grooming? Are they willing to commit to grooming? Now, that's an important consideration. Um, Shedding, hypoallergenic. There's certain breeds that are more hypoallergenic than others. So factoring all of those things in. And I think one of the most important things that people need to think about is their lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Um, wh- how active are they and how much activity can are they going to be able to give their dog? Are you somebody who runs and wants a dog to run with you or, or hunts or, and wants your dog to go hunting with you? Then you're going to want a pretty high energy working type dog. Or is your family, you know, just looking for a dog that's part of the family and hangs out but doesn't really need a, a ton of exercise and enrichment, um, then you're going to want to go with maybe a non-working breed or a smaller dog or something like that. And so really thinking about what your family can do and then reading about the different breeds you're interested in. And of course, the professionals at Animal Services can help you with all those decisions. We definitely can, as at our, all of our area shelters as well. House training. How do you get a puppy to go outside? That's a great question, Lynn, um, and one that's so important because obviously we don't want an animal that goes to the bathroom on the floor in the house. Um, but at first, when you have a new puppy, accidents are to be expected. So that's the first thing. Well, we need to decide where we want our puppy to go, and most people want our puppies to go to the bathroom in the yard. Sure. So we need to get them used to going to the bathroom on the grass. And so we need to take them outside frequently, and we need to reward them as soon as they go potty outside. So I usually recommend a really small, really delicious delicious food treat. And you need to give it to the puppy as soon as it starts to pee or poop. We don't want to wait till you come back in the house because then the puppy thinks, oh, I get a treat from going in the house. They have no idea that they're getting a treat because they went to the potty. 
and we want to take them out frequently. And important times to take them out would be, you know, right after they eat, right after they wake up, um, right during play, and also every couple hours at least initially. And we just want to continue to catch them in the act of going to the bathroom outside and reward them. And if we catch them in the act inside, we want to take them, tell them no, take them right outside, give them a treat when they go outside. What about newspapers? That's kind of a transition, teaching them to go on the newspaper. Does that have benefit or should you go right outside? I with recommend the training? going right outside because puppies tend to and dogs tend to learn to to use a certain substrate to go to the bathroom like grass. And mm -hmm. if we teach them to go on newspaper, then we have to retrain them to go from newspaper to grass. Okay. And okay. so if our end goal is to go on the grass, let's just train them to go on the grass. Much easier, much less confusing for them. Where should a puppy sleep? I recommend that they have their own bed and that they sleep in a crate. Um, and I always recommend crate training puppies because that way um, it can help with house training when you're not home. It can make sure that they're not getting into trouble and chewing up things when you're not around to observe them. Um, but we can also leave the door open because we want it to be like their room. We want it to be a positive place that's never used uh, for punishment. And so I think that's the best place. Um, but a lot of people have their dogs sleep in the bed and that can be fine too if that's okay with you. Just realize they're gonna take up way more room than you ever thought that they would. As you're training your dog, we mentioned uh, house uh, training, and of course there are, are a lot of things that train a puppy. We don't have time, I think, to go into all of them. We've talked about the training dogs on other segments of the program, other episodes of the program. But um, I wanted to talk to you about little dog bites. You know, little puppies are so cute, and they nibble, and they bite. And little... Should you ever allow that uh, a dog to bite, a puppy to bite, even playfully? No, we really don't want them to. And with puppies, there's a period that they go through where they have a hard time determining what they're doing with their mouth. And so sometimes they're nipping and they're licking and they have a hard time just discerning between the two. When they get a little bit older, they can tell better. But a lot of people think that puppy is so cute and they want to play with the puppy's face and use their hand as a play toy. And that's all good and fun until the puppy nips and it gets you on that webbing of your hand or somewhere that it hurts. And then you're scolding the puppy and the puppy's confused because the puppy's getting mixed signals. So I always recommend never using your hands to play with your puppy. Use a toy. And some puppies can be very insistent about trying to nip at your hands or to nip at you. And when you get that behavior we want to redirect them. Have a toy handy. Every time they do that, take your hand away, put a toy in the puppy's mouth. It'll take a little bit, but that'll redirect them, a place where they can appropriately learn and explore with their mouths, especially as they're teething. Should you maybe smack the snout, snout a little bit if a dog bites you? Or? I don't recommend doing that. I never recommend okay. physical force against our dogs. Huh. Redirecting, especially if it's playful puppy nipping, um, you know, they're, they're just trying to learn how to use their mouth. So just redirect them. You can tell them no, but redirect them on to something that it's okay for them to nip and chew on. So once again, reinforcing the positive behavior. Yep. Um, uh, uh, puppies love to follow you around. It seems like they constantly, 24-7, need to be in your company. Um, how can you train a puppy to be happy on its own? Well, giving them a toy that they can interact with, um, so something that they can they can chew on using um, the Kong type toys, where you can put a little bit of peanut butter inside for them to lick. Those can be great. Also, getting your your puppy plenty of exercise. You know, a puppy that is well exercised is gonna be okay to go off by itself and go chew on a toy or a bone or something like that and be fine. Whereas a puppy that's not getting enough exercise is really gonna be following you around all the time. And when should the dog be microchipped? I recommend they get microchipped as soon as you get them. That can oh, be done okay. at any age. And especially a young puppy that doesn't have any idea where it's going um, when it's outside in case it would accidentally get out, um, we want to make sure it gets home. So microchip your pets right away. What's a good name for a puppy? <laughs> oh, that's a great question. Seems like a lot of people think Bella for girls. Well, you know, <laughs> as, as you think about it, go ahead and think about it for a second because I did some research here and, uh, you know, names for dogs and cats or dogs for female and male dogs keep changing over the years as some <laughs> become more and more fashionable. Uh, and for example, I've got a list here, the 10 top uh, puppy names, uh, male and female, from Vet Street, uh, their website, and you don't see any uh, Fidos or Fifis on the list, but here's the top 10 uh, uh, names for male uh, dogs. Max is number one. Mm -hmm. Buddy, Charlie, Rocky, Cooper, Bear, Bentley, Duke, Jack, and Toby are the top ten list for male dogs. Female dogs, Bella is the number one <laughs> list this year. This is actually from 2012. Daisy, Lucy, Molly, Lola, Sophie, like the little dog in the comic strip, Sadie, Chloe, Coco, and Maggie.
<laughs> but from your point of view, what makes a good dog name? Obviously, you're going to be repeating it a thousand times. You are. You want something that is either short or you can shorten to something you can say pretty quickly. Um, I like to give them a middle name so that when oh, I'm upset, no. you can use their their full name. Um, but I think it's a really it's an individual decision. You know, for me, it always takes a little bit to figure out their name. I'm not someone that names them right away. But there'll be something that just sparks me. Sometimes it's a a TV character, or somebody from a movie, or somebody famous, or just a nice name you heard. Obviously, Twilight had a big influence really, on yes, Bella. Really, yes, absolutely. <laughs> well, and, and I read somewhere where it says uh, ending the, the dog's name with a vowel seems to work better having the dog recognize its name. I don't know if that's true or not. I think that can help. And I think that's why we see a lot of those names do in yeah. vowels. So Lucy and Daisy and Lola. Mm -hmm. So it works for uh, some people, I guess. Well, that's the name of the game here on, uh, on For the Love of Animals. I'd like to thank my guest on this segment of the program, Dr. Caroline from Pinellas County Animal Services, the Director of Veterinary Services there. Remember, if you have a question for Dr. Caroline, simply email it to us at animals at pinellascounty.org, and we'll have the answer for you on an upcoming edition of For the Love of Animals. Well, coming up after the break, we'll find out more information about the pets we love and some of the important programs provided by Pinellas County Animal Services. You stay with us. Welcome back to For the Love of Animals. I'm Len Sosinski with the Pinellas County Communications Department. You know, we've talked a lot on this program about Pinellas County Animal Services volunteers and how lost the department would be without them. Not to mention the dogs and cats who rely on volunteers to walk them and play with them and generally provide them with some extra care and attention while they're waiting to go to their forever homes via adoption. But summertime, school's summer vacation time, gives us an opportunity to extend the volunteer experience to area teens home from school. To give youths from 16 to 18 years of age a sense of pride and ownership through volunteering and to prepare them for a future role in the workplace. I think working with animals is a big plus. So here today to talk about the teen volunteer program at Pinellas County Animal Services is Administrative Support Specialist Jan Siebold and Caroline, one of this summer's teen volunteers. Jan, first of all, hello. How are you? Hello. Welcome to the program. And this is Caroline, not Dr. Caroline. We <laughs> have, of course, on our veterinarian segment, but Caroline, the teen volunteer. So, Caroline, hello. How are you? Hi, I'm good. How are um, you? Very nice. Very nice to have you on the program. Jan, let me talk to you for a little bit here first. Uh, tell me a little bit about the teen volunteer program, uh, if you would. How long is the commitment? When is it held? That sort of thing. Oh, this year was our first really structured teen program. We've always accepted teens at the shelter. Uh, usually the Bright Futures students come throughout the year and volunteer. But this summer we had 20 teens that came. Uh, we put them through volunteer orientation. They also attended our SAVE class, which is Shelter Adoption Volunteer Education. Okay. And that trained them on how to walk the dogs and be with the dogs. So that we're kind of right in the middle of that program right now. Yes. And and when does it wrap up? Uh... Well, it wraps up um, when school starts. Okay, actually. of course. So a couple more weeks we have. That's logical. And how long is the commitment? How many uh, hours a week uh, do they volunteer for? Um, usually, it's a four-hour shift. Uh, right. Either a morning shift or an afternoon shift, one or two, maybe three days a week. Okay, excellent. Caroline, uh, if you would, tell us a little bit about yourself. Now, how long, first of all, how long have you lived in Pinellas County? Well, I was born and raised here. Okay, a native. Yeah. <laughs> that counts for a lot. And where do you go to school? Um, I have been attending Osceola, but I'm recently going to SPC for the early college program. Oh, excellent. All right. So what prompted you to become a teen volunteer in the first place? Well, uh, I was looking for bright future hours, and I thought, why not do it with animals? Because I love them so much. And okay. I you know, and here dog. you are, taking care of animals. Yes. <laughs> uh, so that's really, really great. And doing something you like is so important for a summer yeah. project. Jan, tell me, if you would, what's expected of a teen volunteer when they sign up for the program? What tasks are they expected to perform? Well, we certainly want a commitment from them for the summer. And the tasks... Um, they do walking dogs, they help with the kennels, they give the um, animals water, they can be with the cats and the kittens and socializing them. Uh, they help with uh, cleaning some of the Kongs that are all in the dog cages. Mm -hmm. um, office work, computer work, just about anything that we need, they're there for us for the summer. So a little bit of everything. Yes. It sounds like it's fun working with the dogs yeah. and, and the cats. And, and Caroline, tell me, how did you feel now on your first day? 
on the job? Were you nervous? Did you know what to do? Or what was that like for you? Well, I was a little bit nervous, but I decided just to follow the kids that looked like me with the blue shirts, and I kind of figured out what to do pretty quickly. It wasn't too hard. I'm sure people took real good care of you to yeah. make sure you had the information you needed. Now, Jan, what has the reaction been from the community? Have you been able to fill all your volunteer slots? Has this oh, been yes. pretty successful for oh, you? Oh, it's been very successful. And we kept the number of uh, teens that we accepted this summer um, on a low side of 20 because we wanted to give them the opportunity to learn as much as they possibly could. But the community's really um, accepted it. And we're looking for many of the teens to continue during the school year, maybe come back on Saturday or Sunday or during the holidays. Now you mentioned that the teens go through their fair share of training and orientation classes. Yes. What sorts of things do they learn during? Um, well they certainly learn on the, in the first training all about Pinellas County mm -hmm. um, and we talk about um, their safety and our concern for them. Um, we have um, parents involved. As a matter of fact, um, a couple of parents actually attended the orientation, the first orientation. Um, the second orientation was uh, really geared towards the dogs. So how to walk the dog, how to make sure the dog um, doesn't get off leash, mm -hmm. where you walk, where you don't walk. Um, not only the safety for the young adults, but we were really concerned about the safety for our animals as well. So it sounds like, Caroline, that they gave you a pretty good orientation. You knew yes. what to do in every uh, set of circumstances. So what sorts of jobs have you been doing uh, during the program? Well, I walk the dogs, I water them, I play with them, yeah. I clean their cages, clean some Kongs. I mean, it, sometimes it can get a little dirty, but if you look at the big picture, well, you're it's dealing with animals. It. Yeah. <laughs> uh, what has been your favorite part of the experience? Definitely socializing with the animals. I love animals and dogs, especially. I have two, so. I can't ever get enough of them. So you're an animal lover at yes. heart. So you can't you can't have uh, too many pets, uh, pets, cats, and dogs if you're an animal lover. Now, uh, are you glad you joined up for the program? Uh, what would you have been doing instead with your summer if not volunteering at animal services? I'm definitely glad I signed up for the program because I probably wouldn't be doing much of anything else. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> So, so th this pretty much turned out to be your best choice then, yes? Yes, definitely, especially because I actually adopted a dog from the shelter. Oh, okay. Do you have dogs and cats at home other than this I one? I have two dogs, but now I have three. Okay. Well, that's good because all of these dogs, they're wonderful animals at Animal Services, yes. and they all are looking for new homes. And if you can, if you can, if you can be a new home for, a new, for an old dog, that's, that's pretty good progress. Yes. Now, what about your friends? Uh, what have they been doing this summer, first off the bat? And what do they think of what you've been doing this summer? Well, uh, most of my friends have just been going to the beach and stuff, and they ask me about the program because they're looking for Bright Future Hours, too. And I definitely tell them that it's a great thing. And they're like, well, can I sign up now? I'm like, that's eh, a little too late, no, but you have next to year. <laughs> Do you text them during the day to tell, tell them what you're doing if you're doing Sometimes something? Sometimes I'll like take pictures of dogs, and I posted a couple pictures on Instagram of oh, like, sure. different dogs. I'll be like, adopt this dog, please. It's so cute. It needs a home. And Sometimes they think I'm nuts, but... Well, sometimes it works, <laughs> and that's how we get the word out for animals that need uh, new homes. Now, okay, so let's say that your friends are going to join the program next summer. You're the expert now because you've been through the program. What's the one thing that a teen volunteer needs to remember to be a good teen volunteer? Um, definitely not to get too attached to the animals because when they go, it's definitely oh. exciting, but sometimes it's kind of like, oh, I'll never see it again, and just to do a good job and not get lazy and think it's gross. So it's joy and a heartbreak dealing with yeah. these animals sometimes. It's, it's great to see the dog and to play with them, but then all of a sudden they go to a new master yeah. and you've got to make new friends with some of the other animals. Well, Caroline, tell me, what are your own career goals now? Might you be going into something animal related after you get through school and all? Well, when I was little, I did think I wanted to be like a veterinarian, but I don't know. I'm not really sure yet, but I probably because I'm really interested in sciences, and I do love animals a lot. So, I mean, it's a possibility that I would become a vet. Are you going to come back and do it next uh, next summer? You're, you'll still be a teen next summer, won't you? Yes, I will. Um, I'll probably continue on into the school year because I do need some few more hours. So, Now, Jan, um, can teens volunteer uh, at animal services other than in the summertime? Oh, yes, definitely. Um, that we have volunteers that come primarily for their bright future hours. Okay. But you mentioned that some of the parents go through the orientation classes with their teens. Yeah, they, some did this past summer. And I would imagine these parents maybe will be coming back as volunteers as well. We're hoping.
I, I know you always need volunteers, and it's always a great uh, opportunity, I think, for people to relate to these animals, to take care of these animals. And I know we, we talk about how staff uh, relies on the volunteers, but my goodness, these animals really look forward to those volunteer visits, don't they? Oh, they do. I mean, if we didn't have the teens this summer, um, we would definitely feel the shortage. They've been unbelievably great. And Caroline, uh, did you have a? Did you make a, a favorite friend in the kennel, a favorite uh, d dog or cat that you kind of look forward to seeing every day? Um, well, I did, and I brought it home. <laughs> oh, well, you, you did, of course, and why not? That's very, yeah. very logical. But there, there's dozens of them yes, in, in the kennels, are. and they're all really good-looking animals. Yeah, there is this one Topaz, and I think he is the cutest thing. Topaz, yeah, yeah I heard about Topaz. Mm -hmm. Tell me about Topaz. What makes him unique? Well, he's really soft. He has these big pointy ears that stick up, and he's really cuddly, and he has big paws, and he's just so cute. I understand Topaz has been at Animal Services for a while, hasn't yes, he, Jan? Yes, he has. Yeah. We really need a foster home for Topaz. Yeah, he's got some special problems uh, from being in the cage too long. Well, yeah, he's been at the shelter too long, and then he been he's been in his cage too long, so he needs to be out of the shelter environment. And, of course, we have talked to you on previous occasions about the Foster Pet Parent Program, mm -hmm. and it is so important not only for the young puppies and kittens, but uh, for some of these older dogs that yes. have just been caged up too long. Yes, yes. Um, and we have great success with our foster dogs that go into foster care. Have, have you ever thought of that, Caroline, maybe being a foster pet parent? Would your parents allow you to do that? You've um, got so many animals at home already, I know, but what's one more? <laughs> what's one more oh, mouth to feed? Believe me, I've tried multiple times, but getting the third dog was definitely... Uh, now, what, what kind of a dog was this? A uh, pit bull. A oh, pit bull. Yes. And oh. I think it's mixed with hound. Mm -hmm. And it's really nice. It's the cutest thing. It's become my best friend. <laughs> and, and once again, the, the, the combination of, of joy at being able to play with all those animals and the heartbreak of seeing some of them go to good homes uh, being adopted. But that's, yeah. that's what it, it takes to be a Pinellas County volunteer at Animal Services. Well, Caroline, thank you very much, and congratulations on completing this wonderful program in a week or two. Thank you. I'd like to thank my guests this time around, uh, Jan Siebold from Pinellas County Animal Services, along with Caroline. And we, the Caroline the Volunteer, we remind everybody that Pinellas County Animal Services is always looking for volunteers of all ages. If anyone in our broadcast audience is interested in volunteering their time at Pinellas County Animal Services, complete information is available on the Animal Services website. Just go to PinellasCounty.org slash Animal Services. Well, coming up after the break, we go to the mailbag to answer some of your questions about what to do if you lose or find a cat or a dog when we come back. Well, welcome back to For the Love of Animals, a presentation of Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration 1110 AM. I'm your host, Len Sazinski, and joining me right now is John Hohenstern, my old pal John Hohenstern, Senior Control Officer with uh, Pinellas County Animal Services. John, there you are again, right across from me. Uh, good morning, Len. How are you? So good to see you here. We're at the mailbag segment of For the Love of Animals, and I've got one email here that I wanted to talk about, kind of an extended answer, an extended conversation. But here's Pamela from Orlando, actually, and she says, I have found a dog registered with Pinellas County. I thought that was amazing, all the way in Orlando. She lists the tag number. I am trying to find his owners, she says. I live in Orlando, and he was loose on a very busy road. He is in very good condition, clean, and very well behaved, so I'm sure his owners are missing him. Uh, a lost dog all the way in Orlando. You've got the tag number here. Right. What would you do in a situation like this? Well, we'd, uh, you know, give her the phone number information that was in the registration file. Okay. You know, maybe, you know, hopefully it's a cell phone mm -hmm. that she can call them and say, hey, you know, I'm Pamela and I'm on International Drive in Orlando and I found your dog. Yeah. You know, and, uh, you know, either somebody will pick up or hopefully get back in touch with her. But, uh, you know, unfortunately... Um, you know, more times than not when something like this happens, because it, it even happens out of state. We'll get a phone call from somebody in upstate New York mm -hmm. that found a dog with a Pinellas County tag that's, you know, years old. Yeah, sure. You know, and say, well, you know, we can give you this information. I can give you a phone number, but, you know, it's probably not going to, you know, do any good. And last week on the program, we talked about how important it is to keep animal services apprised of any changes in your contact right. information. Up update your information big time, because, it, it, you know, we want to make sure everybody 
everybody goes home that we can get home. Yeah, and here's a case in point. Uh, th- th- it makes the difference between somebody being reunited with their dog in Orlando. You know, maybe they took the dog on vacation or missing the dog for weeks and weeks and maybe never finding the dog again. Yeah, that, that's true. You know, if you don't update the information or if, the, you know, your dog or cat doesn't have a, a tag on it or a microchip, you know, we literally have hundreds of animals at animal services, you know, and, you know, without something, you know, without that bit of identification, sure. the microchip, the license, you know, the only way that, you know, you're going to know if your animal is at our shelter is you're going to have to come down and walk through and look at everybody we have there. And the dogs can't talk. So right. they we can't rely say on this the is where I belong. Yeah. Or, you know, we get the phone calls. Well, it's a black lab. She's yeah. a black lab. And I've, well, you know, I can have four black labs here and one of them could be yours. One of them might not be yours. I don't know your black lab. Well, take me through the process because we've talked about this a lot and I think it's very interesting. And I want to give people a clear idea of the steps that they need to take if they find a dog, if they lose a dog. So I'm at home, I'm doing some yard work in the front yard, and here comes this dog up my driveway. And he's real friendly, and he's good looking. Maybe he has a tag, maybe he doesn't. But I look around, I don't recognize the dog. I look around, I don't see anybody in the neighborhood. Um, what do I do? Do I call you? What do I do? Yeah, well, you know, yeah. Well, if he's got a tag, definitely call us. Okay. You know, or even if he doesn't have a tag, give but us I, a I, call. So I call you. I found this dog, dog roaming right. through the neighborhood. What do you right. do about it? Okay. Well, if he's got a tag, we can give you the information on the owner. Mm-hmm. You know, maybe they're close by. You know, maybe they're just one street over and the dog got out. Hopefully, Mm -hmm. Um, you know, we can give you an address or a phone number that's in the registration file and you can take the dog home if, you know, you want to. A lot of people do. Thank goodness. A lot of people that are concerned. Um, If the dog has no identification on it whatsoever, but it seems to be a a friendly dog and, you know, the citizen is willing to hold on to the dog for a few days, you know, put up signs or whatever, we'll take what's called a found dog report okay, or a found cat report, dog or cat. And uh, basically just, you know, the date where the the animal was found, you know, a a brief description of the animal, you know, uh, the uh, whoever found it, their information. And we actually put it in what we called the the found dog and cat books in the lobby. So when people are coming through looking for their own lost pets, they can refer to those books and hopefully find their their own lost dog. Now, maybe I don't want to do that because I don't really have any dog food or anything like that. I'd rather you guys... Which, which is fine. And, you know, some you know, a lot of people, you know, can't do that because, you know, that, mm-hmm. that they, they either have their own dogs and they're afraid that, you know, sure. something communicable might, uh, you know, get passed. So um, we'll come out and we'll just, we'll pick up the dog. Or, you know, if we're having a really busy day, we might even ask that person to bring the dog into the shelter for us. Okay. Is there a charge uh, connected no, not, with any of that? Not for a stray dog, okay. no. no. We only cho- cho- uh, charge for uh, owner surrenders. So if it's my uh, dog that right. I bring in for then, one then reason or another. Then there's a charge. But if it's a found stray dog or cat, there is no charge. Okay, so this lost dog now is at a new home in Animal Services uh, right. with a lot of dogs and cats there. And, and what happens to this dog now? First of all, does he go through any kind of a screening process? Or what happens? Does well, he get his when, picture taken? What happens? Well, when the, when the dog gets impounded, it's scanned for a microchip. You know, we look for a tag. We look for something, you know, mm-hmm. that, some form of identification. Does it have a collar on anything? Um, if, you know, an animal with no kind of identification whatsoever, no microchip, no license, is only held for four days to give the owner a chance to come and walk through the shelter and, and reclaim their animal. If we do find a microchip or there is some sort of tag on the, the animal's collar, even if it comes you know, from a different state or whatever, we'll hold on to that animal for seven days and make every effort to get in touch with, you know, the information that is on hand at the microchip company or, you know, the animal services that's out of state. Mm -hmm. And hopefully the information, you know, we we can get the animal home. So might that dog go up for adoption eventually? Um, Well, you know, strays without any ID um, at the end of the four days, yeah, they do go through um, to be examined for adoption. And then even the animals with some sort of ID, um, you know, at the end of the seven days, you know, if no one comes forward or we can't contact anyone, you know, we've sent letters, we've made phone calls, we haven't heard anything back, um, they'll be examined for adoption as well. Okay. So now, if that's my dog, say I live a couple of streets over, let's just say, and it could be a couple of streets, yet in right. today's neighborhoods, it could be 100 miles, you right. know, that, that people don't, aren't, aren't that close together anymore. But uh, it's, my, it's my dog, let's just say, and now the dog is at Animal Services. I'm looking in the neighborhood. I'm kind of looking around. I'm talking to my friends, talking to my neighbors. Have you seen this little brown beagle? You know, he's got really brown eyes. What should I do now to try to find this dog again? 
well, you know, signs work wonders, and that's what we we tell people or whatever. If the dog's, you know, the first day the dog or cat's been missing, put up signs. Mm-hmm. You know, if it's a nice dog, if it's a nice cat, maybe they've just got their feet underneath somebody else's dinner table for a, a day or mm-hmm. whatever. But the very next day, you know, if it's 24 hours, then you need to come and walk through the shelter because we do end up with, you know, 98% of all the strays. And you told me there's a 98% chance that that dog is going to wind up at animal services. Yeah, it, it will. So you know. people should know that I've got to make a trip out there. Right. Without any kind of identification on the dog, I mean, we can't call you and say, oh, yeah, I think that dog might belong to Len. Yeah, no, it, sure. I don't know that. So, yeah, and, you know, a lot of people, like I said, they'll call up, well, it's a Boston Terrier and... Da, da, you know, that's not a unique breed anymore or whatever. Yeah. Like I said, we could have, you know, two Boston Terriers and not one of them be yours. They don't have fingerprints, for heaven's sakes. You know, they all look uh, alike. Yep, yeah, that, that's true. So, you know, we, we ask people, you know, no positive identification on the on the animal. You're going to have to come and walk through. And we literally have hundreds of animals at any given time at Animal Services. Now, when's the best time to do that? Any weekends, time, can you do it on the weekends? Yeah, any time that we're open. We're open from 9 to 6, Monday through Friday and nine to one on Saturday, and you can do a walkthrough. You, we ask you, fill out a little slip of paper about you know, who you're looking for, where they went missing from, mm-hmm. who you are, and then we'll take you back and show you everybody that's in the shelter. Now, you just mentioned you have a lot of dogs. It's a big shelter, a lot of dogs there, and I presume you maybe take them backstage when you have the dogs that are not in the adoption area, but right. the, yeah, we've the dogs got three that come different in, the dog, Yeah, we've got three different dog buildings mm-hmm. and, a, and a cat building out back. You know, a, a lot of people when they come to visit us, they just see kind of the adoption center in the in the the front mm-hmm. of the building. Um, you know, we've got uh, several buildings, and we're on about seven acres out there in Largo, and we've got a a, a pretty big compound. And it, it takes a while to do a walk through, especially if you're looking for a a dog or whatever, to walk through all the buildings and make sure that you see everybody. Does it work? Yes, it does. Yeah, do there, people we, find their we, pets? We've had some success stories or whatever, more with dogs than with cats. Mm-hmm. But, uh, yeah, it does happen. And is that a happy moment? Oh, absolutely. We, and we love it when, when there's a success story and, and somebody gets to go back home, mm-hmm. you know, rather than uh, finding a new home. Yeah. And and I know, you know, we've talked about this before. There are just so many, many, many dogs and cats out there. And and they do go, they get lost. And they do jump uh, over fences yeah. and jump out of cars. Uh, right. And, uh, well, a lo- you know, all the, in experience and being there for 16 years now, it's when a uh, a dog person asks their non-dog person friend to dog sit for them while they go away. Oh, my goodness. You know, put your dog in a kennel. Put your cat in a kennel because... Something happens, you know, they're not dog people. They, they, they don't know about, like, making sure the door's closed mm-hmm. or looking behind you when the, someone knocks on the door and the dog runs out and, and he's in a completely different neighborhood now because he doesn't know where he is, you know. And, of course, I, he didn't have his collar on because it rattles at night and it keeps the friend awake. So it, it, that seems to be, uh, I'd say, 70% of the lost dogs is uh, well, you you know, know, people we, looking after. We are going to have a whole segment with Dr. Caroline on just that subject. What to do with your dogs when you're on vacation. Yeah, well, good. Well, yeah, you need to board them professionally, please. Don't trust the, the pet sitters. Right. You know, not if they're not dog people. If they're dog people, that's fine. But when they're not dog people or cat people, they don't think like you do. And that's worse than denting somebody's car that you've borrowed, you know, oh, losing yeah. their dog. I mean, yeah, absolutely. It, I mean, it's very sad, you know. Um, and, and, you know, and then everyone's frantic or whatever. And, you know, oh, what am I supposed to do? Well, you need to come down yeah. here and identify the dog. Absolutely. Check you know. with animals. Animal services first. Absolutely. All right, John, thanks very much. Well, that does bring us to the end of the program, and I want to thank our guest this time around, John Hohenstern, Senior Animal Control Officer with Pinellas County Animal Services. You have been listening to For the Love of Animals, presented by Pinellas County Animal Services and Inspiration 1110 AM. Be sure to be with us next Saturday at 11 AM for another episode of For the Love of Animals. And if you have any questions or comments on anything we've talked about on the program, just send us an email at animals at pinellascounty.org or give us a call at area code 727-582-2600. For more information on Pinellas County Animal Services, including photos of the dogs and cats up for adoption this week, go to our website, pinellascounty.org slash animal services. Once again, thanks for listening. I'm Len Sazinski with the Pinellas County Communications Department. Join us next time for the love of animals.